Hey guys, it's Mike from the WCA. We're taking a look at a game that was played uh, this past weekend. So this is from the week two update. Uh, we have Joey playing the white pieces versus Luke, um, two similarly rated players. And the theme that in the lecture this week was the art of improvisation uh, while playing chess. And we had a pretty long discussion at the beginning uh, with the kids uh, talking about how professionals of, uh, from any performing art really need the ability to kind of find good ideas or perform on the spot when things that are scripted kind of go uh, go wrong or something just happens that's unexpected. Uh, if you're a musician, for example, and you're, you know, uh, your sheet music falls over, or if you're just playing live with a band, um, there's really no reason if you're a well-trained uh, trained musician that you can't continue playing. And that happens with actors. Uh, you can you can probably think of a bunch of reasons yourself, or a, a bunch of examples of uh, where you need to really think on the fly and on your own. So what happened here? The game you're about to see um, is an opening called the Karo Khan, which is the specialty of the person with the black pieces. So it's the response to the move e4. It's the move c6. So Luke plays the Karo Khan all the time and Joey um, doesn't really know too much theory from the white side so what we want is when these kids come across openings that are new to them we want them basically to improvise and, and think on the fly so here uh, because it's so early in the game there isn't that much to think about so players at this level shouldn't have trouble finding good reasonable moves but the training idea is to get them to understand how players find moves when they're thinking on the fly. So here, because it's so early, um, white normally in this position will just play the move d4 here, um, which is taking advantage of the fact that black is giving you the full center. But uh, Joey, for whatever reason, plays another grandmaster move. Uh, he plays the move knight c3. It's not as common as d4, but it kind of threw Luke off a little bit. You can tell from his facial expression that he wasn't uh, that familiar with this move, so he just plays uh, a common sense move. Now, the Karo Khan, when I circle this pawn here on c6, is designed to then strike with the move d5. So you can see that this pawn on c6 is supporting the pawn on d5. And that's basically the idea behind the opening. So we're just happy to see these kids play logical moves when they're kind of on their own. And this is as early as move two. Um, so uh, Joey now takes the full center. And by transposition, the opening has turned into a um, a mainline Karo Khan. So, Black takes the pawn, white takes back, and bishop f5. And this is considered to be the main line or one of the main lines of the Karo Khan, which you have to remember black is very familiar with. White plays a very uh, much less common move. He plays the move bishop to d3, which protects the knight. Uh, more common here is to play knight g3, um, attacking the bishop. And when it moves away, um, you know, white gains a tempo and, and black gets to keep a bishop on a pretty good diagonal. Um, but Joey plays another logical move, although you'll see in a minute why it's not played that frequently at the uh, master level. Um, he protects his knight and he doesn't want to lose time by moving it so he develops a bishop to protect it. Um, the main reason it's not played at the master level too often is you'll notice when the bishop is here on d3, I'll circle that for you, the bishop breaks the connection of the white queen to the white pawn on d4. So if black wants to, black can actually try to win a pawn here with queen takes d4. The problem with the move is, for example, after um, knight f3, black is going to win a pawn, but white is going to going to develop really, really fast. And uh, they, they're ready to castle in one move. The bishop on c1, I'll circle that for you down here, is going to get in the game. So for the price of one pawn, white gets all his pieces out and gets his king castled. Um, so for whatever reason here, Luke decided not to go in for that. And um, he didn't take the pawn. Instead, um, he played here the move knight f6. So let me back it up. Here's here's the position where black can win the pawn, but instead uh, Luke just develops a piece. Now at first glance, this looks like a mistake. 
because when you take the knight, it's check. And you'll also notice that after this knight moves here, the bishop on d3 can just take this for free, or so it seems, but it's really not. It's, it's actually a trick. Um, if white takes this pawn, black can take back, say, with the g-pawn, and if you grab this bishop, um, try to uh, pause the video if you'd like and see how black can get his piece back. And the hint here is just to look at those arrows. Um, the king is open. The a5 to e1 diagonal here is open. The bishop is loose, as we mentioned uh, in the first video. That's a loose piece, meaning it's unprotected. So you have an active queen an open king and a loose piece. That's a recipe for uh, disaster. In this case, black is not winning a piece because he has to get his piece back. Um, so that, that would have been a possible way to play. So for example, if white gets out of check with c3, black can take back. And, and this position is considered slightly better for white and, and not by much at all. It's just because the pawns up here have kind of been broken up and um, so most masters prefer to, to avoid this kind of thing with the black pieces, although it is playable. Um, anyway, so coming back here after Luke develops his knight, um, Joey plays another sensible move. And, and the, the key to remember is these kids are pretty much on their own here. So they're improvising, and they're, they're, but they still have to play good chess moves. So it, it's, it's kind of a skill to play outside of your theoretical knowledge. So here we're only on move six. As these kids get over a thousand and start to push, say twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred, then their opening knowledge increases, and they, it, it's not uncommon for them to go ten or fifteen moves into a game and just play opening theory. But here I can assure you that both of these kids are on their own. So um, let's just see the natural moves that they came up with. So Joey plays queen to e two, which develops the queen and and protects the knight that was being attacked twice on e4. And now at this point, um, here, Luke decides to go for that gambited pawn that we're talking about and grabs it on uh, d4. Okay, so I'm going to add a chess engine on now. And what that will do is it's going to help us get through some of the complications that will uh, pop up later in this game. And also, just to point out here, after black takes that pawn, um, the computer is saying that white is up almost a pawn here. Now I know that sounds strange, uh, but the reason for that is the black queen, as I showed you before, is going to get kicked around. And Joey, in fact, does play the move um, knight to f3, gaining a tempo. And in this position, the queen moved to d5, which um, keeps pressure on this knight here in the middle. You'll notice that it's attacked three times. Um, one way to avoid that knight being captured is to just attack the queen. And if you attack the queen here with pawn to c4, um, she can't take first here, obviously, because uh, you'll lose a queen for a minor piece. Um, but say she goes back to d7, and, you know, white could just castle here. And in this position, uh, again, for the price of a pawn, you'll notice that white is very, very much ahead in development. Um, this bishop here on c1 will develop at some point, and then this line that I'm highlighting with the, uh, the mouse pointer will eventually be occupied by one of the white rooks. And when it does, it's going to put pressure, uh, obviously, on the queen's position. So when you add all of this up, the king's safety, the development of all the minor pieces, and the activity on the file, um, it would be well worth it for white to give up that pawn back there in that position. So going back after... Um, Luke decides to take the pawn. Joey follows up correctly with knight f3. And after queen d5, again, Joey can consider c4 um, to keep the pressure on the position. Instead, he takes. And there's a little tactical trick. He takes and um, it forces black to take back with the g pawn here. Um, you'll notice that you cannot take with the e pawn because of this pin. So he does manage to shatter the black pawns, which can give him, um, you know, in the end game, it might give him some advantage. But right now in the middle game, there are going to be a lot of open lines because of those broken pawns. So we're thrilled with the way this game is going because one, 
the kids are on their own and they're creating really really interesting chess the moves are being checked with a computer so that their their tactical ideas are not bad at all as a matter of fact the computer that I'm looking at right now has the game very level so to have these kids play a very complicated new position and not give anything away tactically is a very very good sign that they're they're working on their own and they're they're finding good moves okay so here uh, bishop c4 was played attacking the queen and black with that extra pawn has an opportunity to try to trade queens here for example with queen e4 um, as you'll see the, the white queen is pinned to the king here and if black um, I'm sorry if white tries to avoid that with a move like bishop e3 um, black can get away with taking the c pawn because you can't gain time on the queen with a move like this because I can just trade queens with you here and that would be uh, uh, pretty good for black so he doesn't decide to go in for that he plays here the queen back to d7 and now because the the white uh, black queen is bouncing around a bit um, white is starting to catch up a little here so perhaps the bishop could come out to e3 uh, something along those lines but white decides to just castle and the game is uh, again level a little advantage for white I think the king's safety is an issue here for uh, for black and rook g8 was played now rook g8 is the kind of move that is so natural to play you put your rook on an open file that leads to the white's king's position but there's a couple of problems with this move the first problem is you need to have another piece working with that rook so you could in the future put your bishop here and put some pressure um, somehow if you can swing the queen around to get in here you may get some um, payback for having that rook on that line but th the downside is the rook by moving to g8 prevents this king from from castling kingside so then the long-term question is going to be what do you do with the black king so here after rook g8 um, white decided to play uh, this knight here to uh, h4 but I want you to take a look at the move rook to d1 instead which is logical and and very strong because it not only hits the queen you know she's most likely gonna uh, run to a square like c7 but when she's hitting when the queen is attacked the rook takes complete control of the d file that's gonna cut off the king that I highlighted up here so um, black has to be very 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 careful here the rook g8 is a big commitment because uh, that black king now uh, may get stranded in the center however the way the game took place after rook g8 white decided to go for uh, knight h4 attacking the bishop on f5 and here comes bishop to h3 so the tactics are starting the pawn cannot take the bishop because of the pin and I use the expression the tactics are starting because that's that's a pretty common um, expression because the players are beginning to mix it up you play a move that's unexpected you play a move that kind of looks bad because the pawn can just take it and then you realize oh man there's there's a rook pinning that pawn but be careful because you're starting the tactics with your king still in the middle of the board so it can be a very very dangerous idea um, can white take advantage of it um, they could maybe a move like queen h5 which is a double attack on this pawn um, you can get a lot of play from that There's, there there are a couple of things he could have tried um, in the game he brought his queen to f3 which is sensible it, it attacks the bishop it uh, puts a little extra protection on this square here um, just keep in mind that um, you know if this queen ever did take this bishop this pin could be a real problem the queen could just take back and you would uh, you would end up losing a piece here um, so anyway in the game black decides to attack the queen and the queen comes to g3 now I want to highlight this for you from the first video we learned that moves like this create pins the reason the rook on g8 is highlighted is because it's loose nothing's protecting it so the black bishop being pinned to the rook creates tactical opportunities for uh, for white so 
white decides um, to pin and black decides here to play the move e6. Now, e6, aside from developing this bishop here, also kind of shuts out the light squared bishop for white. If you're stuck in a position like this, um, the first thing you should always look to do is find a tactical move. So an obvious choice would be to take advantage of this pin, but it's kind of interesting that black's position can withstand that pin if you try to take advantage of it. So for example, if you play the move f3, trying to um, you know, take the bishop, because if it moves, the rook's going to hang up here. Uh, white runs into the move queen d4, check, which at the same time hits this bishop on c4. Um, and that's going to uh, get the piece back in, in case you take this bishop here. The other option would have been if you play h3 here, and black just plays the same move, and that attacks this bishop here on c4. And if it were to run away, and you know here white is thinking, well, I'll move my bishop, and you know black still has trouble here. And then in this position, bishop d6 is very interesting. You'll notice that the black pieces are, are really flying out. The white queen is running out of squares, and that could provoke a whole series of trades here. And um, believe it or not, black is uh, doing okay here. So that pin you couldn't take advantage of um, just yet. So going back, if you can't take advantage of the pin, white has to move something, obviously, and it's not clear exactly what to do. I mean, when I say these kids are on their own, they're really on their own. And another issue for them is, if you look at the pawn structure here, there's no contact between the pawns. So as we mentioned in the first video, the pawn structure kind of creates the terrain that you're playing on. And because it's not fixed, because all of these pawns are mobile, you don't really know move to move exactly where those pawns are going to be. They could change very quickly uh, and in lots of different ways. So because the terrain is not clear, it's hard to plan where to put your pieces. So if you went that deep, and we will go over these ideas with the kids when they come back to class in week three, um, one idea is to say, all right, I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do. What is my opponent going to do? So Luke just played the move e6. He opened up his bishop here. And it seems logical that the bishop may want to come to d6 and attack the queen. So a move that would have been useful would be to prevent that idea and to develop. So you could pause your video here to find white's move. OK, that would be the move bishop f4. My feeling is uh, Joey didn't want to play bishop f4 because he thought he would run into the move pawn to e5, which makes sense. You know, you're going to move a bishop and it's going to get kicked away. If you move it, let's say, to bishop e3, and then black continues with bishop to d6, they're going to get into trouble. Because from this position, you could play a move like rook f to d1. And if you look carefully in this position, uh, black is really getting tied up. Um, the knight up here on b8 doesn't have any good squares to move to. Um, this bishop is pinned. Both of white's bishops are very, very active. And this bishop here, don't forget, is still uh, pinned to this rook up here on g8. So um, turns out bishop f4 would have worked out really well had uh, black continued with this by putting the bishop here. Now, this is actually what happened in the game, but with one move short. Let me show you what I mean. So again, white didn't want to play this move because of the move e5, right? What he did instead makes sense, but he ends up losing time. He puts the bishop on e3 in one move, and then black plays bishop to d6, and white decides to challenge the bishop. By doing so, he runs into e5, the bishop goes to e3, but the difference is in this position, it's black's move. In the other variation that we looked at, it would have been white's move, which white would have answered with rook to d1. So it's funny, it could have been black's move here or black's move uh, back here. And there's a big, big difference. I hope you guys catch that. If you need to pause the video and go over that again, you should. 
uh, because you'll see that white lost a little bit of time by going back and forth with the bishop. Okay, black to play. Um, sensible move, knight a6. Uh, the only square available to the knight gets the piece into the game and gives the black king an option to castle queenside. Um, a lot of people who see this for the first time think that black uh, will have their pawns broken up with a move like bishop takes a6. But I want to show you a cool line. What if white ignores the bishop and just castles? And that looks completely wild, right? It's like, wow, how can I just give up a piece like that? But if you run away, let's say you go back to c4, um, black can play the move bishop h5. And the cool move about uh, castling up here is that you'll notice this rook connects with the rook on g8 which breaks that pin that was really annoying black the whole game. So let's go back. Let me uh, take a look at that again. So the bishop takes the knight, and black completely ignores it. By castling, you'll see the two black rooks are connected, which means when this bishop moves, the black queen will be attacked. So that you get a, a lot of play from, uh, from that position if you decided to go in for that. OK, so after knight a6, the bishop, instead of taking, which uh, again, you know, could have worked out either way, um, Joey decides to play the move rook a to d1, which uh, here is slightly different than the variation that we saw before, because here black can castle the king, uh, really changing things. Now, we're going to give white a lot of credit for his next move. His next move creates a situation where we say the players are mixing it up. And you, you heard that expression in class, and you, you heard it in the last video. Mixing it up in chess means usually taking a chance, um, sacrificing some material, playing a move that looks a little bit shaky or a little bit unorthodox, but at the same time has a lot of play involved. You're going to get something in return for your investment. So what Joey decides to do is, he wants to grab this pawn with this bishop, which would hit the rook up here. The problem is the queen's defending it. So he gives up an exchange, and that means a rook for a minor piece. And by doing so, he then grabs the pawn. Um, the computer doesn't like this move. Now, that's an expression you're going to hear a lot, too, from the coaches, that when you analyze these games, be very, very careful if you're running a computer along with them, that you don't fall victim to the idea that whatever the computer says is always right. They're not always right. Um, in positions where there are lots of tactics, they usually are. And here, I think the computer is right when it says that white doesn't quite get enough for his investment. But you have to remember, your opponents are not computers. The way Joey's playing here is he's taking a risk. He's giving up some material to create a lot of play on the board. So his idea is, is really good. So we would encourage him not to change his style. So the more we see of his work, if we see this pattern repeating, what we'll do for him is try to clean it up a little bit. So if we see him getting too aggressive, we'll just say, look, you need to step back because we've seen three examples where you kind of push too hard. But the good news is it's much easier to slow the kids down than to teach them to be aggressive. So these kinds of moves we, we like a lot at the WCA. Okay, so he goes for this um, exchange sacrifice, it's called, giving up a rook for a minor piece. And now this rook here is attacked. Goes to g7 to keep an eye on this bishop and to attack the bishop here. And then white starts to play for tricks and plays the move f3. So both bishops are now being attacked. The upside of this move is the bishop is pinned to the rook here. The only problem with moving the pawn in this position is you have to make sure that later in the game, the weaknesses you made around the king uh, don't come back to get you. So rook takes, uh, queen takes, check, king b8, and now queen h5 attacking the rook. Uh, black is doing really well here. Um, probably best to just protect the rook uh, from a different square, but he chooses rook d to f8. And the reason I'm saying to protect this from a different square is 
the only function this rook has right now on f8 is to protect uh, the rook here and if that's not absolutely necessary we would recommend that you don't put your rooks in boxes like this they're kind of not as active so white um, is you know in a little bit of trouble here with the material but this move that black played gives uh, gives Joey a little bit of um, freedom it also gives him a move here so he plays knight f5 attacking the black queen the queen goes to b4 and in this position you're going to see the downside of having this rook here on f8 so remember what it was put there for it was put there to defend this rook here it's its only function it really doesn't have anything else it can do in this position so see if you can pause the video here and take advantage of the fact that the rook on f8 really can't move and hopefully you found the move here bishop h6 so black is in a bit of a, a has a bit of a dilemma here because if you move this rook the queen will take this one and if you move this one the bishop will just take back on f8 and you'll get a minor piece you uh the rook back for a minor piece which is the opposite of what happened before um black may have a small advantage after that but white is definitely back in the game so here it's just a tactical oversight um so going back to queen b4 again remember these kids are kind of making this up as they go along uh, chess is a hard game at this point you're so far into the middle game um, there is no script so you're, you're basically playing moves that um, just make sense to you but don't forget to pay attention to the patterns rooks do not belong in boxes they're too tight and they're they're confined to this little space they're not taking advantage of their strength which is to control completely open files so here you see the mouse pointer with not much room imagine this rook here and you can see the amount of space that it would control okay so instead knight h6 another attacking move um, takes the knight out of the center and generally knights are not placed well on the corner and this also allows this rook to move and not only does it move but it now re recreates the pressure uh, on this file here and from video one you guys really should not miss this that there is a this pawn is pinned and that the rook on g7 is putting pressure on the king's position okay so uh, after rook to g7 white decides to attack the black queen but misses something here you attack her but where is she going to go so if i went back to this position if you're black luke has to know that the rook is putting pressure on the king so once his queen gets attacked where do you want the queen to be if you can put her on a square that helps this rook put pressure on the pawn then you're, you're in business and that's exactly what happens the pawn on b2 is hanging and in this position um, white is in a lot of trouble here there's so much pressure against the king and here we don't know it could have been the end of class or he just blundered uh, trying to get things going he played the move f4 which you know kind of makes sense he wants the uh, perhaps if black takes the bishop will take and open a diagonal to the black king but he missed um, these double arrows now the queen on b2 is coordinated with uh, the black rook on g7 so after f4 we have checkmate in one move um, terrific game really really proud of these kids you have to remember the ratings uh, the, you know most of the kids in the class are under a thousand so to play games like this at this level uh, really really makes us happy and most of all they followed the theme of the opening lecture which was you know d different tricks that they learned of how to think on your own really improvising but uh, doing it in a way that makes sense okay so if you have the time you can watch the video again if you have any questions about anything you've seen please come to class with them and also if you can remember bring all of your tactical books or exercises anything you're working on at home bring it to week three so we can get everybody uh, uh, in order for their um, assignments okay guys have a great week